Hello everyone, um, welcome to the second video for lab number four. Uh, now that we've learned about action potentials and the anatomy, we can start talking about the downstream result of action potentials generated by a motor neuron. So in this video, we're gonna be talking about the excitation and contraction coupling, uh, which is basically how a motor neuron stimulus turns into a muscle contraction. So just for a quick review, at the top of the screen is the motor neuron with the secretory vesicles inside of it. And at the bottom of the screen, you have the motor end plate with the ligand gated ion channels. Okay, so we're gonna take what we saw just in that last picture, we're gonna draw it out here, okay? And so hopefully this looks familiar from last video and hopefully you remember some of the components. Here's the uh, synapse between the neuron and the muscle. And we want to talk about what happens when a action potential comes down from the neuron um, and ends up affecting the muscle. So here we have a little action potential coming down to the terminal button, which causes these vesicles to be exocytosed into the synapse. Once in the synapse, acetylcholine can then go and bind our ligand gated ion channels and cause another action potential to propagate down uh, the T tubule. And as it, is, as it comes down the T-tubule, it's going to run into our DHP. And what happens here is DHP is physically connected to our ranidine receptor. And when stimulated, it's going to cause that ranidine receptor to swing open like a door, which allows calcium then to migrate out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and into the cytosol. Now, we don't want calcium just to stay inside the cytosol because that wouldn't be ideal. So the way that we remove calcium from the cytosol is through this pump. Um, and when ATP binds to this pump, it allows calcium to be transported out of the cytosol and into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So now we want to move on and talk about what is going on and what calcium does. So as we see here, here's again our action potential coming down the T-tubule, DHP getting activated. DHP opening the ranidine receptor um, physically and then allowing calcium then to flow out into the cytosol right here. Um, calcium has a high affinity for troponin and troponin is part of a complex that's covering up active sites on um, actin. So first I want you to really look at this picture and notice these three different active sites that I just pointed to. and how they're different, okay? Notice how something's covered there, something's open there, and something's open there. So this first one, we have tropomyosin covering the active site of actin. And then the second one, we have tropomyosin removed from the active site, and again, we have tropomyosin covering the active site. Now, this is important because when calcium binds to troponin, it moves tropomyosin out of the active site of actin, allowing myosin then to bind to actin. So when myosin and then is able to bind to actin, we get on the very microscopic level, the essence of a contraction where the myosin head is able to perform the power stroke and shortening the Z lines and the sarcomere. Now when this happens in all the fibers in a muscle cell and then all the muscle cells in a muscle do this, we get ourselves a contraction of the whole muscle. So now I have a question for you. What if calcium stayed in the cytosol? What effect would that have on the muscle? Give yourself a second to think about it. Ever heard of tetanus? The basic idea behind this is that there's so much calcium in the sarcoplasm that it doesn't allow tropomycin and troponin to go back to actin and cover those active sites. And so myosin stays bound um, and continues to do those power strokes and continues to contract the muscle. Okay, so this concludes the second video for lab four. And in the next video, we're gonna talk about the excitation coupling pathway and how it can be affected by different drugs or different disease states. Um, so it should be a fun lesson. We're gonna talk more about the clinical relevance of all of this. Thanks.